This episode contains material that might be triggering for some. If you need to stop the podcast at any time to take care of yourself, please do so. If you need support, you can call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 988. Dialectical Behavior Therapy was created in the 1980s by Marsha Linehan in Seattle, Washington. Today, DBT is taught all over the world. We're two therapists who believe everyone can benefit from DBT skills. I'm Kate. I'm Michelle. And And this this is is DBT and Me. Hello, everyone. Hi, everybody. Yes, it's time for the monthly episode for August. Ta-da. I don't know why I said that in a sort of like spooky face. Apparently, I know that it's getting close to Halloween. I don't know, man. There's Halloween um, stuff at the grocery store. That's true. <laughs> I don't understand the world we live in anymore. Anyway, uh, so what are we going to be talking about this month? This month, we're going to be talking about how we've been using DBT. We realized we've been chatting with a bunch of guests the last few months. We have been, uh, you know, approaching topics around different uh, ways that DBT can help in life, but we haven't been as self-reflective, I guess, uh, in a while, it felt like to me. So I thought, hey, Michelle, maybe we ought to talk about some shit what's been going on in our lives uh, lately. (laughs) So have fun. We're really ill prepared to do that part. Um, And (laughs) then what skills have we actually been using, right? What what rubber has been meeting the road DBT wise for us the most lately? Uh, so that's what we're going to be launching into. Before we do that, though, time for some self-promotion. So to start with, I want to thank two new patrons, Robin and Allison. Thank you. Shout out thank to you. Thank you, Robin and Allison. And if you want a shout out and other fun perks like Robin and Allison have gotten, you can also become a patron for us at patreon.com slash dbtandme. Another way you can support us is through our Etsy shop. So etsy.com slash shop slash dbtandme. Give us a rate and review on Apple Podcasts or wherever it is that you're listening to us right now. You can always email us at dbtandmepodcast at gmail.com. We love to hear from folks. You give us great ideas for topics, etc. So please keep writing in. It's great. Uh, And as always, check out our other podcast, The Couch and the Chair. It's available wherever you're listening to my voice right now. Uh, so yeah, that's that's what we're going to be doing. And we're going to alternate because that worked better. We had the same number of things. So Michelle is just going to be starting us off today with what's been going on and what'd you do? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think what we each came up with, I, I think three kind of main things things. Yes. Oh, I forgot the air conditioner. I'm sorry. I also have an air conditioner in the room with me and it kicks on and off. And maybe you guys don't ever hear it. And you're like, what the fuck are you talking about, Kate? But in case you do, I'm sorry, but it's 96 degrees outside and I'm not sorry enough to turn the AC off. So I just wanted to put that out there in case it's an annoying noise. So awesome. Sorry. And glad you you remembered. (laughs) I forgot, even though you told me you were going to mention that. (laughs) <laughs> Oops. Um, but yeah, as Kate said, we're going to alternate. We're each just going to talk about something that's been going on in our lives and then one or more DBT skills that we were using during that thing. And we each have three life events. So we'll be going back and forth a couple times here to just catch you guys up on things. And I don't know. I liked when you suggested this, Kate, because I personally find that I learn things best when I hear about how other people are using things. And I think that really applies to DBT, that it can be helpful to learn how this can work for you when you hear how it works for other people. So I'm hoping this episode will have benefit for people, even though we're really not doing any, I don't know, teaching or whatever we would call that. (laughs) Oh, fair. Yeah. It's it's experiential learning or something. Yes, there you go. (laughs) Exactly. Yes, I I love that kind of learning myself. So hopefully other people do too. Uh, So I'll start off with, I guess, a really positive thing that happened in my life within the last month, which is that every summer, I've done this for, gosh, six summers now. I only missed last year because my son was really young. 
um, is that my husband and I volunteer at a camp for kids who are burn survivors. So my husband was burned when he was six years old and he attended this camp as a camper and then went on to become a counselor as an adult. And so when I met him, he told me about this camp and I was like, that sounds awesome. I've never been to summer camp. I would love to go with you. So I've now been a counselor with him for a number of years. And this year I wasn't able to go back full time. Um, camp is a week long and we still decided that, you know, our son isn't even two yet. It might be a long time to leave him for an entire week with his grandparents. So I only went up a couple days to help and volunteer. But this year, I felt more nervous about camp than usual because we were going to be at a brand new location. And so basically the camp has been at this one location for 30 plus years. And then this year we were going to be in a totally new place. So I just, <laughs> I remember driving there for my first day and there was something, you know, I was feeling jittery and nervous and it was just taking me back to how there had been so many times in my life when I was younger. I mean, like elementary school, middle school age, but I mean, even through high school, I would just really struggle to embrace new experiences when I was younger. I still think I struggle with it from time to time, though I struggle with it a lot less than I used to. It just seemed so bizarre to me when I would look around at other people and maybe there was more going on internally for them than I knew, but they seemed to really seek out new experiences or adapt easily to them or really enjoy them. And I did not feel that way at all. I wanted to avoid new experiences like the plague and just stick to the places and the people that I knew and already felt comfortable with. And in general, my life these days looks pretty routine, <laughs> um, you know, with being a mom and just work and life is just pretty steady. And I realized this was probably going to be the first like big new experience that I had had in some time of going to a brand new place and really not knowing what to expect at all once I was there. I knew I was, of course, going to be around familiar people, people who I had volunteered with for years now and that I was going to know people and my husband would be there. But just being in this new setting was actually pretty anxiety provoking for me. Um, and what helped me was really actually using some willingness. That's what I found to be my go-to DBT skill when I do find myself in uncharted waters, you could say, doing something new that I've never done in a new place or around new people, there's lots of there's lots of DBT skills that could work. But for me, when I'm able to find myself having an attitude of willingness, that's when I can really calm my anxiety down and just remind myself, like, go with the flow. It's going to be OK. <laughs> You're going to figure this out <laughs> and just try to enjoy it. Because that's what I think for me anyways, I think willingness is all about. Willingness is about enjoying and embracing something, not just enduring it, not just getting through it. That's what willfulness would be, but actually really embracing and welcoming the newness of something when maybe there is a part of you that's really worried deep down about all that newness and all of that stuff that you don't know and can't predict. So I really tried to tell myself, you know, as I was stepping out of the car and I'm in this new place and I didn't know what the day would bring. Cause that's the thing also, when you show up as a volunteer, you don't know what you're going to be doing that day. They just kind of put you uh -huh. wherever they need you. You have no clue what's going to happen. <laughs> and I just tried to tell myself, you know, this is something I've been looking forward to for months. I was only going to be here for three days. Let me make the most of this. And so I find myself that I normally, we talked about this before too, I normally come into DBT skills backwards in the sense of it's not like as I was getting out of the car, I was like, Michelle, practice willingness. I didn't think about it that way. I realized it after the fact when I was like, oh, okay, that wasn't so bad. I actually felt pretty good about myself and how I handled this. And then I reflect on it later and I'm like, well, why was that? And then I was able to be like, oh, probably because you were doing willingness, but I don't realize it till later. So still doing the skill, even if not intentionally choosing it in advance. 
but that's really what helped me get through that. And I've realized too, that that's what's helped me get through a lot of new experiences in my life is when I can, when I can be willing instead of willful. So that's my first one. What do you want to start with Kate? I didn't put anything positive. (laughs) (laughs) That's my only positive. (laughs) Um, So sorry guys. Uh, Let's see. My, unsurprisingly, perhaps, uh, first one centers around the emotion of anxiety. Um, I'm sure I've talked about being polyamorous and other stuff over the course of the podcast. That being said, my husband and I have not been doing that actively in quite a long while. Uh, Seven, eight years, something like that. (laughs) A long time. Um, And so uh, he recently... Uh, pursued another woman um, and also poor guy that has also been terminated so there's been a lot of emotional ups and downs and sideways and surprises and unknowns and negotiations (laughs) and occasional boundary violations because no one's perfect and blah it has been so much anxiety (laughs) since gosh oh right it was right before his and mine's anniversary of all funny things so since late May mid-May, late May, right in there. Um, It's just been a really, really anxiety-ridden time Um, in a couple of different ways. Like, I'm very prone to future tripping. I'm not someone who spends a lot of time living in the past. That's not the place my anxiety takes me. My anxiety definitely hauls my ass off into the future, Um, uh, making up fantastical stories that just spam my buttons for me, which is great. <clears throat> or some other thing that's not great. Um, so yeah, there's just been just so much. I mean, other emotions too, right? Uh, it's not like I've just been sitting here in a miasma of anxiety and nothing else. Uh, pride uh, and curiosity and enjoyment and some hope and confusion <laughs> and all sorts of other other feelings. But I would say anxiety has by and large been the one that I've been having to cope with the most. Um, And uh, interestingly, I would say most of these, Michelle, I did think of as skills in the moment. I'm telling you guys, I'm so steeped in DBT. I thought DBT was something familiar to me and utilized by me before Michelle and I wrote a book on the topic and before I was leading two two hour groups a week and a drop in group. And anyway, I feel like it's on my bones now. I think about it consistently more than I more than that, like integrated skill use that I, I was used to for a lot of years. Like you're talking about, Michelle, where you kind of mm-hmm. just understand those principles and they impact how you like view or approach things. Now, most right. of these I was like, all right, I got to do this now. <laughs> I am choosing this skill and now I will do this skill. And now I will do this skill. Yep. Uh, And so the first one is tip. Um, I've used the uh, less effective cousin of the intense exercise because that's still really hard on my body, but I've definitely used movement a little bit, but far more than that, I have been using paced breathing. So lots of very deliberate. Uh, I would say, I don't know. I probably most of the time do square breathing these days. That didn't used to be the case, but I've been, I've been enjoying that. But uh, yeah, lots of breathing exercises, lots of trying to slow my body's roll. Excuse me, clearly it's yawning o'clock. Um, yeah. So lots, lots, lots of paced breathing. I also like paced breathing because it's a sneaky coping skill. Unless people are paying really close attention to you, they don't necessarily know that you're doing it. Um, Though I will say if I'm closer to a panic attack, uh, square breathing doesn't work as well and I have to do the really long exhalations. And for that, I do tend to purse my lips. So that's noticeable uh, because it makes a little noise and makes me make a face. But square breathing, at least, tends to go right under the radar. Uh, So that's one skill. I would say the other thing that I use the most consistently to help myself get through that was mindfulness and specifically, all right, well, I'm going to say mindfulness of the present moment. And you're going to say, Kate, all mindfulness is of the present moment. That's the fucking point, Um, which I understand. But (laughs) the way I kept grounding myself to that state of mindfulness was uh, I kept asking myself the question of like, 
okay, but is, is everything tolerable right now? All right, like, don't just quit being in the future. Quit thinking about other things, right? Like, just right this fucking moment. Are you okay? Is this okay? Like, is this moment an acceptable moment? And by and large, the answer was yes, right? That, because so much of my anxiety is generated by, frankly, made up stuff. Um, and so when I can ask myself that question, it's kind of like I get a mindfulness of my body sometimes by reminding myself, right, I exist below the neck. Um, sometimes little like prompts or mantras or questions can help me get into a particular kind of state uh, of of mindfulness. And yeah, the thing I kept just needing to bring myself back to the moment. And um, it wasn't until you were talking about it, Michelle, actually, that I added in a little willingness for this part, too, because I feel like it goes together. It's that like bringing myself back to the moment and then trying to engage with the moment with willingness, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Right? Like, bring myself back. Is this okay? Yes, this is okay. Excellent. Now, like, actually engage. Right? Like, move forward as though things are okay. Right? Don't move forward as though things are going to go fucking horribly awry at every moment. Um, so, yeah, I would say <laughs> tip, mindfulness in brackets of the present moment. Um, and yes, I'm being redundant and I don't care. Uh, and then willingness, probably my three skills. <laughs> it's been a really hard couple of months, guys. Um, more to come on that for my thing number two. But <laughs> I'll pass the torch to you for now, Michelle, while I let Jin in, because it's not a real DBT and me episode if Jin doesn't interrupt us. So. <laughs> yes, bring him in. <laughs> So my second one, I I realized I wrote it down as a thing to talk about. And then I realized I haven't actually, I think, talked about it with really much of anybody in my life. And here I am talking about it to all of you listening. <laughs> but there's been this thing on my mind that's been hard for me to shake a little bit. Just the past couple months or so, that's a more parenting thing, you could say, because... I didn't really realize, I think, how all-encompassing this is until having my son of just, like, being in this constant state of, I don't know, I'm sure I'm not alone in this from a parenting perspective, but I just always want to be doing whatever I can to make sure that my son is as okay as possible. And it's, there, there is no perfect parent. But I constantly, as a parent, am trying to think about what could I do differently? What could I do better? How can I support his development? And because I've never been a parent before this, <laughs> everything is new and different. And I don't know what to expect. And I don't know what's normal or what's not normal. And so I just get into this state sometimes where I find myself questioning, like, is everything okay? Like with him, is everything okay? Now, it is. <laughs> but I notice this in particular when it comes to his development and milestones and kind of the not is he okay right now, but is he okay more broadly? And my son, um, I guess to give a little bit of context or background, my son has not been ahead on anything. Um, he's been very average, if not, you could say slightly behind what they maybe consider average. Um, for example, they say that most kids take their first steps at 12 months. My son didn't walk until 15 and a half months. Now that's considered normal still. They say, you know, we want kids to be ideally walking by 18 months as an example. So was he well within that range? Sure. But was he walking as early as some other kids do? No. And I just noticed this with other things. It took him a little while to warm up to solid foods compared to some peers of his who I was like, oh my God, they're devouring everything in sight. My son doesn't want to eat any of that stuff, <laughs> right? I, it's been very hard for me to not get into a state of comparison when I see him around other kids his age and just questioning like, is, is this all okay? Do I need to be doing more for him? All of this stuff. And I feel a lot of shame. I think this feels important to name. I feel a lot of shame 
even naming that my brain goes there. Like, I don't want to be that parent. I don't want to be that parent that's constantly questioning, you know, is he quote on track, unquote, all the time when everything points to that he is. He's growing and changing and learning all the time. And he's just, you know, every kid is different and he's doing things when he's ready to do them. And his pediatrician has never had any concerns about his development. And I tell myself, you know, Michelle, you shouldn't either. But it's hard to get that part of my brain to shut up. And what I've really noticed lately is that it's been circling that part of my brain, has been circling lately around his speech development. You know, my son is 21 months, so he's going to be two in November. And when I've read about language milestones that he's, you know, supposed to be hitting at his age, he's not there. Um, he does not have very many words. He has a few. When I say a few, I mean a few, like he has three, four. Um, but he does not have a lot of what they call expressive language yet, where he is using speech to verbalize what he wants. He has lots of other ways to communicate what he wants. <laughs> he points and shows me pictures of things, <laughs> you know, but using speech, using words and verbal language, he's not doing it very much. And I'm aware that he's not doing it as much as what I read about as other kids his age might be doing. And I found myself almost daily, if I'm being really honest, at some point in time or another, having this inner battle in my head where this one part of me is like, something's wrong. <laughs> you know, gosh, you know, what, what, what needs to be done to intervene and help him and get him, you know, caught up you could say and this other part of me that goes Michelle you're freaking out over nothing don't be that parent like I just said there's shame around being that parent don't be that parent it's fine he's gonna be okay and then the other part comes in but like but Michelle you don't want to miss something <laughs> right just all of this swirls in my head and What's been helping, honestly, and again, it, I come into this backwards, um, but now I've started, once I realized I was like, oh, Michelle, you're actually kind of using this, <laughs> then I've tried to consciously use it more often, which is check the facts. Because for me, if you think about it from a wise mind perspective and how wise mind is the intersection between our reason mind and our emotion mind, my emotion mind sometimes will run away with me when it comes to this topic of his speech and his language development. And my emotion mind wants to future trip all over the place. And my emotion mind comes to, you know, all these worries and all these conclusions that are, you know, not based in reality that I have no evidence of. And then what honestly helps me come into my reason mind is using check the facts and being able to go, Michelle, look, what do you actually know? I, it's not like I've pulled out a check the facts worksheet and done it like that. I haven't done it like that. But there's a couple pieces I've been honing in on more lately. One is what do I actually know? And what I actually know is that my son is vocalizing a lot more than he used to. He doesn't just point at something anymore. He points and in his own way, da, 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 da. <laughs> right? He does, da, 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 da is a common one <laughs> right now. But he points and he vocalizes with the pointing. So he's attempting to use and formulate words. Um, I've seen signs that he's starting to try to repeat a little more what we say. He'll typically only repeat something once and I'm like, oh my gosh, did you just say blah, blah, blah? And then he won't do it again. <laughs> but I've seen those signs where I'm like, oh, okay, he is growing, he is changing. So I try to tell myself, what do I actually know? And what I do actually know is that I see him attempting to use more speech each day. It's not perfect, of course. It may not be where most of his peers are, but I see him trying. 
And then the other piece of check the facts that I'll go to sometimes is that piece of what is the worst case scenario that I'm that I'm fearing? Like, what's the catastrophe in my brain? Um, and honestly, the catastrophe in my brain. Well, it goes it goes to places that then I'm quickly able to debunk. <laughs> I'm like, no, he's not nonverbal. Like, but I get to this place where I worry, I think a lot that I'm, what if, you know, they talk, they, who's they? I don't know. The larger world <laughs> of childhood development talks a lot about how important early intervention is. I don't want it to be that I go along like, he's fine, he's fine, he's fine, he's fine, he's fine. He'll get there, he'll get there, he'll get there, he'll get there. And then before you know it, then it reaches a crisis point where it's like, okay, now he really needs intervention. And something comes up around like, well, if only he had gotten this sooner. Like I'm that kind of parent where if there are resources out there, I don't care what kind of resources, <laughs> I want the resources. I want the books. I want the service providers. I want like anything and everything to have it be that I'm getting the support that I need as a mom and that my son might be getting whatever support he might need to just, you know, be his best self. And kids do sometimes need an extra hand with grasping certain things. And so I start to worry, like, that what if we postpone getting him help for the sake of he's fine, which is strongly the approach my husband takes. Uh, strongly, strongly my husband believes that Noah is on track. And it doesn't matter how many articles, books, whatever I show him that says, you know, they say he's supposed to have this many words. He doesn't even have half the, that many words. My husband refuses to believe that anything is wrong. <laughs> so I worry that if there is something wrong, that what if we don't take action on it? Or what if there's a lot of action that needs to be taken? Like, what if we do catch this early, if there is really something going on, and then it's like, wow, but now you've got to dive into this whole world and there's a lot you need to do to support him. And even though I'd want to do that, that's overwhelming and stressful. So I get in this weird place around like, I want to make sure that my son is getting any resources and help that he might need. And then also even thinking about him needing resources and help feels kind of overwhelming. And the way that I've been coping with that is telling myself, you know, Michelle, he's going to go to his two-year appointment. He's going to go to his two-year checkup. They're going to ask about speech. And even if they don't ask about speech, you can tell them. These are the words that I see him use. Just be honest, be as objective as possible. This is what I see him doing. This is where he's at. What do you think? Do you think that he could benefit from speech therapy? What's your take on it? And I've just been trying to bring myself back to that. Like Michelle, nothing is going, nothing is going to happen between now and November when you take him back to the doctor. Just be patient. See how his speech develops between now and then. That's three months away. That's a long time in toddler land for lots of growth and development to take place. And I just remind myself that if interventions are needed, that I have done enough of my due diligence as a parent to, again, kind of research and know like what's typical, what's not, et cetera, that if my gut is telling me that he might need some extra help in this area, I have it within me to advocate for that when the time comes. And that time is maybe not right now. That time is probably in a couple months of like, wait until, give it a little more time and see what happens. So check the facts has kind of been this thing that I've been using in a roundabout fashion to sort of, yeah, bring in my logic mind and kind of try to calm me down when my brain wants to get on this runaway train I'm like, what if he has a speech delay? <laughs> what do you do? <laughs> you gotta, you gotta get him help now, immediately. When my brain starts going off in that direction, check the facts is bringing me back to reminding me that those steps can be taken in time. 
And it's okay to strike this balance between let's wait and see what he does developmentally all on his own in the months to come and let your pediatrician know and see what they say. And really, there is no worst case scenario here. They'll either be like, you know what? He seems fine. <laughs> no interventions needed. Okay. Or they'll be like, yeah, maybe he needs interventions. And then he's getting the help he needs. Like there is no worst case scenario here. It's kind of what checking the facts has reminded me. And have I had to do it repeatedly? Yes. Because that emotion of mine is strong for me when it comes to anything with parenting. Anything with parenting. My emotion mind just goes nuts. It's hard to not carry a lot of fear when you're a parent mm -hmm. about all kinds of things. Big, small, doesn't matter. There's just kind of like, again, for me anyways, like this, this constant like lurking somewhere back there. Of just like, am I doing this right? And is my child okay? At all times. And it's kind of exhausting. <laughs> um... But it feels good when I can remind myself that like in this moment, everything is okay to, yeah, to strike that balance between giving it time and also asking really thoughtful questions and making sure that I'm making sure that his pediatrician has all the information needed to advise us on what they think is best. Uh, I don't know how long I talked there for. But that's what I've been using is check the facts when I have almost daily worries about my son's speech Aww. and how it's developing. <laughs> Good one. I like, I always love, it always makes my heart a little warm, Michelle, when I hear you or other people using the shortcut of what do I actually know? It makes me happy. Yeah, it's so helpful. Because I mean, I even in my head at a certain point, once I realized and I was like, Michelle, you're kind of using check the facts here. I actually did. There was one day where I was like, hey, let me see if I know the questions off the top of my head. <laughs> now, pulling up a workshop, I was like, I... Maybe I should think about all of them. And I couldn't think of all of them off the top of my head. I didn't have time to pull up a worksheet. So I literally, I, I, yeah, I asked myself that question and I went to the, what is the catastrophe and how am I going yep. to cope with it? Yeah, yeah, that's, that's where the, I, I think went. that's the other best I was part. Like, okay, right? I think that's yep. enough. I think that's all I really need to just keep coming back to over and over and over again. That makes perfect sense to me. Yeah, I think, yeah, what do I actually know? Like both of those to me, the catastrophe and the what do I actually know are so tied into the concept of storytelling, right? Like what story mm -hmm. are we telling ourselves? Mm -hmm. um, and so, like, yeah, I think they'd like clear it out in two layers. What do I actually know? Okay, that clears out one bit of the story that I'm telling myself. Yeah. And then like, what's the catastrophe is like another layer of the story. Sometimes it seems mm -hmm. like to me. So no, that makes sense to me is those two questions. Yeah. Yep. I will say this too, to all you listening, because I think it would actually really help me potentially. I was going to say, for those of you listening, if you have had a child who, I don't know, you've been in the same headspace I'm in, or again, like maybe you've had a child who has been like delayed in speech or that kind of a thing. Like, tell me your inspirational stories where you're like, Michelle, I was worried about this when my son was 18 months, but now my son is nine. And you know, <laughs> this, that, or the other, right? Like, I don't know. I love inspirational parenting stories of people who are further along on this parenting journey and have kids older than mine. Uh, just being like, hey, it's gonna be okay one way or the other. Like, you will figure this out. It's gonna be all right. Those things are helpful. So post those in the Facebook group if you got them. I'd love to hear stories like that. Or uh, email I like us. I'll read I was them. gonna say, or email. <laughs> yeah, that works too. If, if you don't want the whole group, up to you. Yeah. Um, all right, is that on to me then? Yep. This one's hard. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, uh, I've been saying, friends, that this has been a really rough, how many months is that even? All of June, all of July, like half of this month and half of mm -hmm. May, so About almost three. four months, yeah, three months-ish, three and a half, something like that. Um, and part of what that has looked like for me, unfortunately, has been a resurgence, uh, a strong resurgence in self-harm urges and some self-harm relapsing, um, which is always a giant bummer. I don't take relapses as hard as I used to. Um, I used to hang a lot of pride and self-worth on remaining without self-harming. Um, 
I still remember how awful I felt about myself the first time I had a relapse that was after years, plural years, like, and how much that sucked. Um, so I try and be, I try and be more easygoing with myself about it. Um, for those of you who struggle with this in the same way I have, I will say that the less I, uh, shit on myself for relapses on average, the less intense they are. Because when I'm really hard on myself about it, there's this sense of like wanting to get as much as I can uh, out of the relapse or and or a giant pile of fuck it. Um, right. Like I'm, I'm if if any relapse is enough to make me feel awful about myself, well, then why not just relapse as badly or as completely as I maybe am having urges to. Whereas if I can be kind to myself about a relapse, then there's space to have it be more controlled, at least for me. Right. A smaller less intense episode, uh, less intense relapse. Uh, so, uh, I know it's hard. I, I understand. I spent a lot of time, um, of my life hanging out in the, uh, guilt tripping myself, shaming myself, etc. space. Anytime I self-harmed, um, I mean, up to, and to an extent since becoming a therapist, it's been recent that I've really understood the connection here of, uh, being nicer to myself, making the relapses less bad. Um, so, pro tip that's not technically related to DBT. <laughs> pro tip. Ah, oh, that's a weird thing to say. I am a professional self-harmer. What the fuck even? Jesus Christ, sometimes my mouth runs away with me before I think. Um, ADHD too, friends. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, it's been, it's been rough. So, this is not just a story of success. I have not managed to use my skills all the way up through... Um, like I haven't been able to prevent relapse entirely by using my skills. So this isn't just a story of success, but it is a story of partial success because it did work some of the times. Um, and so I also want to normalize that, right? It's, it's a good thing to keep approaching the skills, especially the ones around self-harm, even if they don't always do what you want them to do, right? Fully. Right? Even if it means that it's more harm reduction-y and you just do less than you would have done otherwise, uh, or if it manages to work sometimes and misses entirely others, right? If you abandon the skill, then what are you, what's taking its place, right? Um, so the unsurprising number one skill that I was using uh, around this self-harm urges was ride the wave, right? Is just wait it out, <laughs> right? Um, not just, uh, oftentimes for me, that looks like distraction. So, uh, putting on movies works well for me, sometimes video games, um, something that I have to think about and engage in can be helpful. Um, so sometimes artistic endeavors, so those can be really hard if I'm feeling in a really hard place. So that's probably a less common one. Um, sometimes reaching out to friends, um, to, uh, help with those. Um, right. So definitely not just sitting in the dark, twiddling my thumbs, uh, waiting for the urge to pass, uh, trying to take a more active role in helping it pass also. Um, but yeah, ride the wave. Definitely, definitely the one that I've made the most use of, um, managed to never cry hard enough to actually puke, but got close a couple of times, um, which is a uh, pretty standard for me if I'm having really intense uh, self-harm urges and I manage to ride the wave. If it's not, if I can't distract myself, if it's that bad, <laughs> I'm in for some serious crying. Loud, ugly, messy, terrible, <laughs> vengeful crying. I don't know. It's awful. Um, but it passes. Uh, and I'll still tell you this. It's funny. It's a place that I can be slightly mindfully observant, even while in my feels really hard, is that I, I promise, folks, when you're weeping that hard is the absolute best time to observe the truth of the um, emotions only last 90 seconds thing. Because you're not thinking. Ah ha ha. You're crying so hard you're not thinking. And so you cry real fucking hard for about 90 seconds. <laughs> and then you start breathing a little bit again. Maybe get the sup sups right. It quiets down. And then you think again. <laughs> And then you cry hor horrifically for another 90 seconds. It's fantastic. I think it's, <laughs> I'm actually, it's my best proving ground for that thing, which I constantly am hoping science will disprove one day, except for I can actually watch it in real time when I'm crying <laughs> that hard. So that's weird. Um, 
I got off on a tangent, Michelle. Uh, so, ride the wave. <laughs> useful. Uh, not always enough, but useful. Um, opposite action. I meant to name that with the anxiety bit instead. Uh, it does work here too, but I've been using it more with the anxiety because anxiety can cause me to want to run away from situations. And so, uh, with the situation with my partner's girlfriend... I was definitely using opposite action to try and lean in uh, in places where my anxiety told me to run away. So that showed up there and I forgot to mention it because I wrote it in the wrong place. Um, but also with, uh, with self-harm urges, especially if they're lower intensity in the moment, I can use opposite action to like deliberately do kind things for my body or for myself. Um, sometimes that can look like you smooshed opposite action and um, self-soothing together in one place. Uh, that's that's one way that opposite action can look for me when I'm trying not to self-harm. Um, yeah, kindness uh, and and honesty about it, right? One of the things that uh, self-harm thrives in is secrecy. Uh, so I would say that reaching out to friends... Uh, when I'm feeling like self-harming and telling people that I'm feeling like self-harming is in and of itself to me a bit of a contradiction or an opposite action uh, to actually self-harming. So now I'm the one who has no fucking idea how long I've talked, but uh, there we go. Punting it back to you, Michelle, now that I've confessed. Well, and I don't know. I think it feels important to say that as one of the people who, I mean, we had phone calls, we had texts, um, that I, as your friend and as somebody who was supporting you during some of those times, I mean, when I hear you name, like what, you know, from a DBT perspective, cause that's yeah. of course what we're here to talk about is DBT skills. Like, you know, what were you using and what was helping you? It's like, I, I, I bore witness to it in a lot of ways. I wasn't physically yeah. there with you, oh, yeah. but I, I knew that that's what you were working on is like riding the wave. And I mean, there was one night where we had a, we had a very tough conversation, yes. you, you know, <laughs> you were in a, you were in a rough spot and you were yeah, just kind of really like, God, place. getting through these next few hours is going to suck. And, <laughs> you know, I'm, I know that it did. And yet, like, I just feel, I just feel proud of you for, you know, and it's kind of like what you said. I think there's really something to be said for how much effort and intention counts when we're mm -hmm. getting through really, really, really hard things. Um, and I just saw that over and over from you that like you were putting forth a lot of effort to get through some hard times and that you, you were really working hard because it's not easy. I don't know. I will take this opportunity with everybody listening to say I'm proud of you because I don't know mm -hmm. if I've said that up until this point, but I am very proud of you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you for being my friend who I can reach out to and have explosive phone calls. So, you know, yeah. that's nice. <laughs> <laughs> very emotive. You. There you go. <laughs> Much emotional lability was demonstrated. <laughs> for those of you who know therapist terms. Yeah. I was emotional for those who don't. Um, so... Awesome. On to your last one, I guess. Right? My last one. Yes. For my last one, I don't know. I will start off with, I guess, leading with the skill here. And I saved it for last because, you guys, I am using radical acceptance. Woo! And quite proud of myself for using radical acceptance. When I can look back and be like, Michelle, it has taken you a while to get to this point. <laughs> As it typically does with radical acceptance, right? We fight reality for a long time, most of the time before we actually come around to radically accepting it. But I've reached a radical acceptance place with something pretty major in the last month. So to tell the story or what happened behind that. So my husband and I decided to take our son to the aquarium for the first time a couple weekends ago. And the aquarium itself was really fun. We had a good time. And then we got in the car to drive home and we got stuck in horrific traffic, horrific traffic, like not moving, sitting through 10 plus cycles of a light 
traffic because it turns out that in Seattle, there was a big annual parade going on and I had no idea what was happening that day or that close to the aquarium or anything like that. So we go to leave and we were literally sitting in downtown Seattle, gosh, I want to say for close to an hour and a half before we finally got out and got on our way home. And I don't, I, I can't say exactly what it was for my husband. I'm not in his brain, <laughs> but this was a pretty triggering, overwhelming situation for my husband sitting in traffic like this. And I've known this for a long time about he and I, that we have different tolerance levels when it comes to stress. I think a lot of that stems from different life experiences. My husband has a pretty significant trauma background. And it's actually been a thing, I think, that has been pretty widely researched and proven now that for people who have a history of trauma, they don't have to be in a super, super stressful or unsafe situation for their brain to register it as such and for them to have a larger response than somebody who doesn't have a trauma history and doesn't have that kind of brain wiring, uh, which applies to me. I, I don't have a significant trauma history and he does. And so we cope with stress very differently. And this typically looks like me, I don't know, really trying to stay calm and talk, talk, talk through it really, I think for both of our sakes and just be like, it's going to be okay. Things are going to be fine, blah, blah, blah. Meanwhile, my husband does not have that response. And he's like, why is all this traffic happening? You know, he's, <sighs> he's, you know, what are we doing? How are we going to get out of here? Blah, 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 right? Like, He's really stressing about this. And me, I'm just like, you know what? Even though this sucks, this is going to be okay. It's going to be fine. We're going to get home when we get home. I eventually moved to the back seat to sit with our son so I could feed him some snacks to prevent him from getting hungry. I was just kind of like, this is going to be okay. This is going to be fine. And we often have those very disparate responses where I'm like, it's going to be fine. And my husband's like, it's not fine. It's not okay. Right? We often get into these places. But what I found reflecting back, and I, I don't know what exactly it was about this day, being in the car with him like this, seeing it play out, but I guess I saw, and I mean, we've been together for six years now. I mean, it's not like we've only been together a couple months. Like, I mean, I know the man decently well by this point. And I've known this difference as far as our stress responses go to things. But I just saw it very clearly that what I've been trying to do all along in many regards without realizing I was doing this, I've been trying to make myself responsible for his reactions to things. So if he's having a big reaction to things, I've been telling myself that in order to be like a good partner to him, I need to somehow come alongside him and really, really try to support him in calming down. Like that that's somehow my job to help him calm down and to reduce his stress. Like that's my responsibility somehow. Where that comes from, <laughs> that that runs real deep. I mean, I think I've seen my mom do that with nearly everybody, where if somebody's struggling, my mom is constantly like diving in, trying to help them, whether they've asked for it or not. And I think I was just exposed and given so many messages that that's what you're supposed to do, that that's what it means to like love somebody or care about somebody is that you need to somehow rescue them from their own hardships and their their big emotions, that I've been trying to do that with my husband for a very long time. And you know what, guys? It doesn't work. It does not work. A lot of times in the past, right, I've tried to get him to kind of calm down. And again, I'm just trying to be this calming presence. I'm trying all these different things. And typically his stress stays exactly where it is or it gets even higher. <laughs> and then I wind up feeling like I did something wrong because I wasn't able to calm him down. 
Or, honestly, I get a little resentful of him. I get mad that he didn't calm down when I was trying so hard to get him to calm down. And I caught myself when we were in the car, sitting in this traffic, starting to do that a little bit. And I didn't really realize it until after, right? After we're home, after we're out of that situation, after I'm kind of processing everything. And I just had this moment of clarity where I just told myself, Michelle, it's not your fault that he gets as stressed as he does. And it is not your job to fix it for him. He has to be responsible for managing his own stress. Now, of course, the thing that's hard about that is that he may not manage his own stress, right? (laughs) Oftentimes, to me anyways, from the outside looking in, his stress is like a runaway train. I mean, once it leaves the station, that ain't stopping for nothing (laughs) until the stressful situation is over and done with. It's a thing for him to work on in his own therapy is figuring out what makes it hard for him to kind of regulate his emotions and bring his stress level down once it's begun. Uh, It it seems to me he has a hard time kind of putting a stop to that until he's out of the stressful situation. So it's hard to witness that. It's hard to see that with somebody that you love when they get stressed and they almost like don't know how to get out of it themselves and you want so badly to help them. But I just had this moment where I was like, you've got to stop doing that. Like, you've got to. And I just realized, because we talk about this with radical acceptance, radical acceptance stops pain from turning into suffering. And in that moment, I really realized that I had been suffering (laughs) for a long time, putting all this pressure on myself to try to help him out of those situations. And to be clear, right, it doesn't mean that the next time he's stressed, I'm just going to be like, well, peace out, (laughs) you know, kind of a thing. Bye. Figure it all out yourself. But what I did reach the conclusion of is, Michelle, you can't be doing more for him than he's doing for himself. It's up to him to tell you what support he needs and to communicate that to you. If he says, hey, Michelle, can you, you know, I don't know. He has said this actually before at times where he's had, say, a really hard therapy session. He's texted me and he's like, hey, can you come upstairs and give me a hug? Right? I'm on it. All about it. You tell me how I can help you. I'm more than happy to dive in and help you. But that I have been over-functioning like this longer than I realized of being like, oh my gosh, he's stressed. I've got to make, I've got to make it better. Let me calm him down, right? Because I'm, I'm calm so I can help him be calm. But then what happens is while I'm helping him be calm, even if I still look calm on the outside, now I'm all riled up on the inside trying to make it better for him. Where really what needs to happen is that like he needs to make it better for himself. I just need to focus on myself. And I feel so much lighter. I can't even tell you how much lighter I feel reaching that place. And of course, this doesn't mean that he won't ever be stressed again. Of course, he's going to be stressed again, inevitably. (laughs) Maybe today, maybe tomorrow. Something, you know, life is a stressful thing to live through. Um, There's always things that are going to happen that aren't what we want or aren't according to plan. But the next time that he's in a situation or we're in a situation together where I see his stress elevating, I will be able to come at it from a different angle of being able to just recognize like that is his. That's his stuff. That's not my stuff. That's not mine. I get to have my own experience. He can be stressed about this. I don't have to be. Let me just differentiation for the win, Michelle. It really, really is. Yes, exactly. Because it's such a sneaky, like codependent thing when we expect and want to be having like the same experience as our partner, right? Like I'm calm, you're supposed to be calm. Well, (laughs) wouldn't that be great if he was, but I can't control what his reaction is to things. Only he can control that. So whatever reaction he has is on him, whatever whatever reaction I have is on me. And let's just leave it at that. 
And that's actually me being a really good, I think, partner to be able to be like, I'm going to kind of take a step back and I'm here if you need me. Let me know if you need me. But I'm going to trust and believe that you can work through this on your own, even if it's really messy, because it's probably going to be pretty messy. But that that's what's going to be best for my mental health to take that step back. And it's actually going to be best for him in the long run to actually figure out what it looks like to work through that on his own rather than having me jump in all the time to be like, let me make it better. 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 <laughs> then he's not learning how to make it better himself. Um, so a pretty big radical acceptance shift for me in recent weeks that I feel quite proud of, actually. That's awesome. Radical acceptance is hard. It is hard. And that's the thing. It, like, when it came, I was like, oh, my God, right? Because it's been, I think... Like, we talk about this sometimes, I think, with radical acceptance. It tends to be about bigger, larger yeah. things in life. It can be about small things, right? Like, I'm driving around trying to find a parking space. Okay, I'm radically accepting that there's no available parking spaces, right? It can look like that. But when when it's about larger things, I mean, man, it hits you like a ton of bricks. And it's just been a while since there was something that I was able to radically accept, like, that with that much clarity um and I mean that was a few weeks ago and I've noticed myself being in a totally different headspace that's so much better for me ever since uh, it just awesome. feels so much better so yeah felt felt pretty nice to to get there even <laughs> if it's taken a long time <laughs> fair yeah it does it often it's a long journey radical acceptance quite often I think mm-hmm um, yep. All right. My last thing, which is a totally weird new thing. Um, so uh, I know I've talked about it. So you guys know that I opened my clinic last year, Heartfelt Mental Health. Um, we just celebrated the one year birthday so <laughs> of exciting. the clinic. I know we went to a skate rink and basically had a children's birthday party because it's only a one year old clinic. Right. <laughs> um, so I went roller skating in a like a cocktail dress. <laughs> <laughs> and a cape anyway um because what a silliness but right so it's it's a it's a new clinic and i am new to being a boss i had always sworn i would never have employees because <laughs> i have never thought of myself as a boss as a leader of humans um and so it's been a learning curve uh i think by and large i've done a lot of things really well and really right uh, I hear good things from many of my employees, and I have enjoyed the process uh, position, something like that, more than I thought I would, which is excellent. That said, <laughs> there are hard parts, and I have hitherto managed to avoid the part I've most wanted to avoid, which is having to terminate someone's uh, employment. So I'm getting ready to do that. What is for me tomorrow? <laughs> I don't know when the fuck people are going to listen to this, but at this moment it's tomorrow. Um, you will have done it by the time they listen to it. That's for Oh, sure. that's true. That's true. So uh, I will have, I will report on next month. I don't know. Um, so all right, I have an intern who uh, there seems to have been a uh, communication kerfuffle between them and their school. They thought they could take three last classes concurrently while in their internship. And it turns out they cannot. Those three classes are in fact prerequisites. And now instead of being able to roll straight from their practicum into their internship, they are uh, not able to begin, uh, their, in their practicum ends next month for context, and they're not able to see clients again until at least January of next year. And we can't keep them in that circumstance, right? Their contract stipulates that um, they can only work for us as an intern while they're in an internship program at their school, and they're not going to be. Uh, there's other more complicated things that go into what this is going to look like moving forward, but that's the nitty gritty. That's the bare bones facts of what's going on. And let me tell you, I am not excited. <laughs> 
about delivering this news um, or about even making this decision, right? So I will admit, like, my emotion mind had a lot going on about this whole thing, a lot of guilt, um, a lot of fear of what their reaction is going to be, um, definitely, I don't know, a feeling like guilt, but not quite, like, I don't know, guilty apprehension. Um, it's just anxiety, right? Um, just a sense of, like, desperation to try and uh maybe there's a way we can make this work out differently right like oh maybe we could do this that or the other thing but just consistently coming to the conclusion that it just can't work uh for us and for the clinic and <clears throat> slash me <laughs> and for this uh intern to continue forward together so what skills have I been using? Uh, one is wise mind, right? Like I just kept having to come back to wise mind. My my reason mind would like to ski daddle uh, from this situation uh, and or I am prone to ski daddling it. I'm not sure which way is true. By the way, it's the harder one to bring on board, right? And to realize that like, no, right? Like I, I do own the business. I have to look out for it as an entity and not just for my own like selfish reasons, right? Like I have to look out for the business as an entity because it's the employer of uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight people right now. Um, all right. Like I, I am these people's livelihood. I have to look out for the mechanism by which they are making their livelihood. Right. Um, and as much as I hate being a stickler to most things, people we have contracts and sign them and go over them for a reason and so right like i have to keep balancing myself out <laughs> to, with reason mind to end up in a more wise mind place right that realizes that i need to take into account yeah my emotionality absolutely like it's important to help guide me in how i phrase things right the gentleness that i bring this up with like there's definitely different things that my emotion mind can help bring to the table that are useful, not just fears and guilts and things like that. Um, but I really am needing to lean a lot heavier into my reason mind, which is not, as you guys, I think, know by now the place that I tend to hang out the most firmly. So that has been a challenge, but also incredibly helpful, right? Every time I'm able to kind of come back to that more wise mind space, it helps like settle me. And so while I'm, I am antsy, I'm an anxious, I'm apprehensive. Um, and probably other A words, avoidant. Um, the, <laughs> I actually also feel a lot more calm about it than I would have anticipated. Like, yeah, there's anxiety and other things there, but I feel mostly <laughs> centered, right? Grounded. It, it feels like how I notice my body feel when I've made a wise mind choice, right? That kind of settled down, um, grounded, centered place. Doesn't mean I don't have any feelings anymore, <laughs> but I am able to, um, I don't know, put them in context and, and feel okay moving forward, uh, despite that. Uh, and last but not least, a little bit less formally, uh, more like how I think Michelle sometimes stumbles into skills, but I would say the other thing that I've been utilizing is a form of cope ahead. I definitely have been trying to uh, walk myself through, right, what I'm going to say, how I'm going to deliver it, what my want my body posture and facial expressions to be like, right? Like I am trying to rehearse essentially going as well and my doing things as skillfully as I'd like. Um, for what is the part of being a boss I have most feared. <laughs> so go me. You can do it. You'll do great. I can do it. Thanks. Text me tomorrow and tell me how it goes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I don't think I, I doubt my person will be in their wise mind during the exchange. Let's just say that much. Yeah. Uh, I wouldn't be either. Right? Like I got, oh, there you go. Right. Adding difficulty to it for entirely different reasons. But I got let go from my first internship place. And that sucked royally. I right? Didn't know that. So, yeah, I feel bad. <laughs> and. I have a bigger thing to look out for, right? Like, it's not just me and this person. It's a bigger system that we're both a part of um, that I need to look out for the welfare of. So, but, and true. that's that, I guess. <laughs> uh, all right, Ooh. you're going to talk about coffee hour. I 
am. Yeah. So as we move towards wrapping up coffee hour coming up on September 4th, Labor Day here in the U.S. <laughs> so, I mean, as per usual, if it falls on any kind of major holiday. holiday when people tend to have a lot of plans or things going on totally understand if we don't get live attendees but last month what we did for coffee hour was we talked about how to plan your first night of a group so when you're getting all your group participants together for the first time you're meeting them they're meeting you they've never done this thing called a dbt group before we really went over in depth last month all the different points and things that you want to include to really orient them and to help them feel comfortable kicking off this group experience. There was one thing we didn't talk about because it deserves a coffee hour all of its own, which is that one of the things that Kate and I do, arguably I would say maybe one of the most important things that we do that first night of a group is that we go over group guidelines. Uh -huh. I mean, yeah. you could use any word you want, rules, <laughs> expectations yeah boundaries yeah any any word you want to put on that but we go over we have 13 of them i was looking back up for our groups we go over the 13 different guidelines that we have for group participants so these are the things that we expect them to follow while they're in the group and we realized that we would not be able to do all 13 of those things justice trying to talk about it in last month's coffee hour. So we're going to be talking about it for this upcoming coffee hour. And really, I mean, going over, we've had to alter our guidelines for virtual groups, too. So we're going to talk about the differences between like an in-person group what's expected there and some slightly different things <laughs> for virtual groups. And I was also looking back at um, the DBT manual has its own set of guidelines. Um, so we'll share those with you all as well. But yeah, they're slightly different from ours. Some overlap, some differences, but just to give you a different perspective. Yeah. And so we'll be sharing all of those with the people who sign up for coffee hour. And what we'll be spending that time on is really going over what the guidelines are and then also what happens when people violate the guidelines, because that happens. I mean, we probably have an example for each and every one. Some are bigger violations, some are smaller violations, but what do you do if somebody is not following one of those guidelines and how can you intervene? And so we'll be talking about what that's looked like for us too. Um, at times to basically be like, well, how do we address that when somebody isn't following that guideline? So that's what we're going to be doing for next month's coffee hour, all about getting down to the nitty gritty of what the rules are for a group and how to lay them out and how to enforce them. We'll be fun about. times. Fun <laughs> times. No, honestly, like I think I said- The coffee hour will be fun. <laughs> I was like, Kate is the one who goes over this every group because it's not my favorite thing. <laughs> <laughs> I don't really like talking about the guidelines. I don't like enforcing the guidelines. Ooh, you know, the whole thing just like stirs up stuff in me where I'm like, I don't want to be the bad guy. Ah, yeah. But okay. sometimes we need okay. to be the bad guy. I was going to say, apparently you should use some wise mind and cope ahead since that's what I've been using when I'm preparing to be the bad guy tomorrow. <laughs> that's true. Yes. Very much Sorry, so. I'm that's just being nice a dick. about leading with someone. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah, we, we can both be a united front or we can both put our yes. heads together of like, okay, what do we want to do about so-and-so breaking this guideline, right? Um, so it's not just, of course, ever me on my own on an island trying to reinforce these rules. But yeah, I don't know. Makes me a little squeamish. Sometimes little antsy when we've had times yeah. in groups where I'm like, oh, now I need to tell someone so that we see what you're doing. It's not okay. But we'll share our experiences with you guys so you can learn from them and feel confident in it for yourself if you're like me and you're like, ooh, guidelines enforcing them. I don't know about that. Black. We'll help you. Yeah, exactly. That's your response. Like, blah. <laughs> I don't want to enforce rules. We'll, we'll walk you through it. <laughs> All right. Awesome sauce. I think that's it. And we're on to closing moment. Yes. Oh, the final thing, though, I'll say oh. about coffee hour, because, I mean, I've said it before. It probably goes without saying. If you want to sign up, the link is down in the show notes. So that's where Truth. you can find it to sign up. Yes. Okay. That's all. <laughs> the okay. end. Sorry about the, I mean, just a recap of the apologies about the AC, because if it's going to be annoying at any point, it's going to be during the closing moment mm -hmm. <laughs> when we're the quietest. Um, but for now, go ahead and get comfortable, whatever that means for you right now. 
can be sitting, standing, laying down, whatever feels good and right in your body. And if you're comfortable doing so, I invite you to go ahead and close your eyes. As per usual, we're going to start by just noticing our breath. You don't need to breathe any more slowly or any more deeply than you are naturally. It's just about paying attention. Just about really focusing in on the rhythms and the sensations of your breath and letting them welcome you into your body and into the present moment. So for today's closing moment, I'd love for you, similarly to how Michelle and I have done, to think about your life recently and think about what skills you've been using. Maybe it's one skill that you are just focused in on, mindfulness, self-soothing, something that is your go-to and you have been pulling it out a lot lately. Or maybe it's a smorgasbord. Maybe you have more skills than you can probably remember that you've been deploying lately. Whatever the case, just take a moment and reflect. What skills have you used? How have they worked? How did it feel to remember and to utilize a skill in a situation where once you wouldn't have known how to? When you're thinking about using the skills, can you reflect on maybe how it felt in your body when you used the skill? Or even when you're thinking about using it now? Take a moment to reflect and to be proud. Whether the skill did what you wanted it to do or not, be proud for trying, for thinking of it, for remembering it for putting effort towards yourself, your healing, your health. So yeah, just take this moment to do a brief inventory. What's been going on? What skills have you used? Maybe in this reflecting, you'll notice a couple of places you'd like to be using skills that you haven't been. That's a wonderful thing, if so. Just checking in with yourself, doing a little self-accountability. How is DBT showing up in and impacting your life right now? But for now, you can go ahead and let go of that recollection or reflection. Though you can certainly continue it after the podcast today if you like. But for now... I invite you to go ahead and gently come back into your breath and into your body. You might take a couple slow, deep breaths here. Do some gentle stretching. Rotating your wrists or neck or ankles or shoulders. And whenever you're ready, you can open your eyes. Thanks so much, everyone. Thanks, everybody. To learn more about us and the DBT skills we're teaching each week, join our Facebook group. Simply log in to your Facebook profile and search for DBT and Me Podcast.